I would dare to pull that back a little bit, but that cable, as you saw, it just kind of did its weird thing, and I was afraid I'd mess it all up. Uh, well, I want to thank Sean for inviting me to come here. And uh, one, um, one of the things, uh, when I started the golf project, which was in, in 2011, um, one of the things I always wanted to do was to have it shown at a museum in Louisiana, and you are the museum. So I just wanted to let you know that. It's very exciting. Um, so just a little bit about who I am. Um, my work is, as you can see from looking at it in person, it's really hard to see it in images. And, uh, although that's not one, that's just a photo I took underwater. Um, so when you, um, if you go to my website, there's a lot of details. So if you want to know more about me or see more details of pieces that were in this show, I'd say just head there. Okay, now I'm going to try to do this. So, oh, good. Why isn't my what happened to my mouse? It's up. Why isn't it down here? It's not showing up on my screen. Oh, I was one. Okay, there we go. All right. Weird. Okay. Oh, great. Only half of my text comes up. Lovely. Um, so, um, I've been sailing since I was 16. I grew up in the Midwest, which probably sounds really bizarre. My parents have nothing to do with the water, so I don't understand where it came from. I think it was in my DNA or something. And, uh, okay, I have to fix something here. Adam, why am I only getting half of my notes? So then you scroll. I know, but I'm only getting, oh, okay, all right. Oh, the rest of them. There it is, there it is, okay. now it is, okay, thank you. God, I'm like an idiot. You tell how much I've used PowerPoint in a while. Um, so I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about this exhibition, even though it's in the dark, because it's kind of significant the way it's laid out. Um, on the right side, this is the cause. This is the, the project that I did in 2011, collecting debris from the ocean, plastic debris. And uh, I also went, I went to Johnson's Bayou and uh, Grand Isle. And Grand Isle, they had just reopened it um, after the oil spill, so there's lots of oily gloves in it. And then um, the left is the effect. This is, this is my representation of dying coral, and you might wonder why it's really bright at the very end, and that's because they found out in, uh, there's a great movie on Netflix called Chasing Coral, really worth watching. And they found out through time-lapse photography that coral when it dies, it flashes these brilliant colors, almost like to say, bye. And, and then it goes, you know, white, you know, it, it bleaches you know, brown and then white. Um, the other thing about this exhibition is the things, color, um, beauty is a, is, I feel is a real um, powerful way, message. And so I like to make work that's beautiful, even though it's about a message that's, you know, not beautiful. Uh, and, in this, and color to me is very important. And in this exhibition, if you look around, anything that deals with color really is what is the danger. So think red tide, think plastic, and as you walk around and look at the show. Um, in fact, take a real close look at the wallpaper. Okay, so there's, so I've been sailing since I was 16, as I said, and there's something about water that as human beings, it attracts us, it fascinates us, it terrifies us. Uh, Jacques Cousteau spoke the words that really has stayed with me for years, is that the sea, once it casts its, its spell, holds one in its net of wonder forever. P -p 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 I can't even talk. People protect what they love. Okay, what did I just do wrong? Um, this is my backyard now. Uh, I've spent most of my life in the Midwest, um, taught at Washington University in St. Louis for most of my career. And now my, um, uh, my husband and I built a house in Jamestown, Rhode Island, which isn't actually an island. And this is what I do when I'm not in the studio. I'm an avid sailor and protector of the ocean, I guess you could say. So my early works, I'm just, I'm just going to show like one earlier piece. And as I said, if you want to go to my website, all that's documented there. This is a piece done in Denmark, and it was called Heart of the Sea. And early works prior to 2005, my work usually dealt with um, movement in the ocean, the way you viewed water in the ocean. I did a whole body of work about um, uh, rafts, the Cuban rafts, which I thought were really interesting. This particular piece dealt with the idea that man is always trying to control the sea, and so there are plumb bobs running down the center of the piece, I feel like I need a pointer up here, um, signifying that man wants, you know, wants the horizon to be level, but if you're on a boat, it's never level. So. Um, 
I like to play in water, and oddly enough, I like to work in water. Um, I started making paper in 1975. I love paper. I think it's, uh, it's an amazing medium. It's never bored me. It's const I've constantly learned new ways to work with it, and I'm still learning new ways to work with it. Um, but in 2005, I had a life-changing experience. I got cancer, and for about for four months, I didn't do any art, which is kind of not who I am. I'm always making something in the studio. I, I live where I work. And I was swimming while I was, when I was sick. And I also was, um, you know, really wishing I was on the ocean, particularly, to be honest. And uh, one of my friends was going back. She grew up on an island in North Carolina or South Carolina. And she asked what I wanted, and I said, Annette. And this was prior to my being sick. And when I started making art again, I started thinking about the fact that when I was sick, I felt like a fish caught in a net, that I was helpless and I had no control. But then also, it's a safety net. So again, it has that sort of twofold meaning, which is, has a lot to do in my work, uh, the two things I think about. So this particular piece, uh, which is called Tangled Up in Blue, I also steal si names from songs like I Love It, who I like a lot. Uh, and in this piece, those beautiful bl ultramarine blue pieces uh, in detail are actually sections from the PET scans that I had when I was um, in, in treatment. And don't, don't tell the doctors, you can unlock your medical records files and get the images if you know the right person. <laughs> they say, oh, you can unlock these. Yeah, right, sure. So, so I started, um, when I, after I was sick, I didn't have the kind of energy I had before, and so I started cutting on my work, and oddly enough, I started cutting with a scalpel, which you can think of all kinds of metaphors for that one. Um, and this particular piece is called, Would You Swim the Ocean for to Ease My Pain? This is like 2007. And these are layers, it's, they're so hard. That's, I'm so glad that one piece is in the back because I layer sheets of paper that I'm coloring, and I, I get a critical number, and then I start layering them. These particular pieces, these first ones, are flat layers. And interspersed in these layers of these watery nets are um, crab pots and um, lobster pots. And the image that's like like an upper right-hand corner, you can see that blue shape? If you see the actual piece, it's actually a section of my chest where my hands are crossed and my bracelets are showing up in the PET scan. So in a way, this body of work was something of a self-portrait. Um, there's one thing that... Um, John F. Kennedy made me think about, I, uh, he's also being a sailor, of course, that he said that all of us have in our veins the exact amount of salt, a percentage of salt, as is, and in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, and in our tears, and we are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we go back to whence we came. And I created an exhibition from this uh, a body of work called From Whence We Came because I was feeling this relationship to the ocean um, more, uh, you know, like it was, it was stronger for whatever reason because I was reading articles at that time how uh, horseshoe crabs, that they harvest them in the Chesapeake Bay for their blood. They don't kill them. They withdraw their blood, which is blue, and it's used to detect dangerous endotoxins in the medical industry. So I was reading that at the same time I was like starting to do this new body of work. And then I also read an article about how they found that certain sponges in the ocean might be the new cures for cancer. So my brain in my, in my blender of the way I think about making art was, OK, so they're finding these cures now. And more and more people are dying of cancer. And we are destroying the ocean. OK. This is not a great, you know, this is not a great look into the future, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> so this particular piece is called um, Fading Forest of the Seas. In the bottom right-hand corner are um, photographic plates that I did of um, bleached coral. And then the upper right is actually sort of a, a sort of deteriorated photographic plate. All of these things, by the way, I print and I make the paper and I paint with paper pulp. That's primarily how I make my work, um, is of the great... Um, Pacific Garbage Patch that out, was out in the West Coast. And it was just beginning to get more notice and was being written up uh, about this time. So I've been working in my studio all this time. Now, I always go to the ocean to sail. I race boats on a lake. I've been doing it since I was 16. So I always have to get my ocean fix. And I came up with the idea that 
I wanted to take my studio to the ocean. And I thought, okay, well, I'm in the middle. Where can I impact? What can I think about this? So I thought about, I wrote the grant that I wanted to go to the Gulf of Mexico where the Mississippi Delta creates a dead zone. And whether you know it or not, it, it's loaded uh, um, with one of the highest concentrations of plastic in the world. It's on par with the mouth of the Chinese Yangtze River, which we think China is so filthy. Well, guess what? We're, we're right there up with them. And 90% of floating debris in the ocean is plastic. So my work went from being sort of personal and internal to I started to have this global um, thought about making my work. So I'm, I, got the can I actually got the grant, which I couldn't believe I did. And other like paying me to have a two week vacation on a van, in a van or in a mobile home, which by the way, it was really fun. Took my 150 pound dog and my studio assistant. So this is the studio piled up inside with concentrated paper pulp and screens. And we ended up in a uh, fishing camp along the Texas Louisiana border because they would allow my 150 pound dog to be there. It's hard to get a 150 pound dog. He was a Bouvier at a lot of places. So. Here is this beautiful beach, which I'd never been to before. The water was, it was pretty rough, so the water was not very pleasant. I never ever saw the Gulf blue, by the way. It was always just dirty brown. And I'm right next to Port Arthur with the refineries, you know, which again is this yin and yang of beauty and, you know, not so beautiful. And then down the beach was uh, a swimming advisory where we went to look for shark's teeth with the, the owner of the fish camp. He's told me you could always find him there. And I have a ring, by the way, from my golf project that I'm wearing, is, which is a shark's tooth. I did find one. So uh, what we did then was we started collecting plastic. And because the, 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 the wind was in the right direction, this plastic was coming up on shore like you couldn't. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't pick it up fast enough. And there were. Um, Bags from the fishing boats, where they use the salt, plastic, I mean, all of this is results of that. Uh, there were, it was plastic as far away from, as Haiti, it was marked, you know, Mexico. So when you see this picture, look up close at the water, at the wallpaper a little later. So, um, uh, so I, I documented these. I wanted to think sort of something like being at a in a science museum, which is another reason why these are placed so close together. It's like... You know, this is a time that I've documented Louisiana in 2011 and 2012. Um, and I would uh, basically, we had the paper which we um, liquefied with ocean water. And I'm amazed that actually the salt has not destroyed the paper, which it has not, which is interesting. And then they, they, they would dry. And uh, I went back a second time because in the camper I couldn't take really big screens. So I went back then and rented one of the fish camp cabins and took a trailer and took these big screens, two of the pieces are, which are behind the, sc um, the screen. And that was my dog who rest in peace is no longer with me. So um, I then cur um, curated the work and created um, 20 pieces for Johnson's Bayou and 20 pieces for uh, um, Grand Isle. And it was sort of interesting because I never really realized that I would find such different things in two different places. Uh, but one of the most interesting things was walking on the beach. Uh, first of all, I found a lot of thick plastic gloves that they used to clean up the oil spill floating in the ocean. Okay, that was nice for cleanup, right? You know, you see these things and you go, okay, whatever. You know, you try not to think about it. You know, maybe they blew off, but I don't think so. Uh, but then that morning um, that I was getting ready to leave, and this is one of the things with the gloves. I noticed that the beach had this like really gray like sand and I thought, I don't remember the beach being this black. So I ran back to the camper because we were getting ready to leave in about an hour and grabbed a, a couple of big um, Ziploc bags, packed the stuff up in it and uh, left. Realizing later when I rubbed it in my hands that this was the stuff that they used to coagulate, coagulate the oil to push it to the, as I said, the bottom of the sea. But guess what? In 2014, so this was 2011, 2014, I am in Captiva. There was a huge storm from the northwest, which turns up things in the bottom of the sea. And there were all these beautiful black and white shells on the beach. And I thought, I've never seen black and white shells. I'm a little, I'm a little slow to the jump sometimes, people. So, you know, I, I look at things and they're pretty, but I don't think of what they really are. And 
came to realize as they were drying in my, on the deck where I was sitting, uh, that they had that oily, they, that came off in my hands. That's the oily residue that was on the, the shells at the bottom of the ocean. So I created this piece which had both the oily residue, the shells from Captiva, and then there's a net in the middle, which is called the Mississippi Delta, which some, with uh, debris uh, inside of that. So this result of, of going out in the field, which I've never usually done, I've always like gone places and taken photographs and drawings and gone back to my studio, really changed my thinking about uh, my working methodology. And so the result, uh, one of the results was this piece, Hello Sailor, that's in the middle of the floor um, in the gallery. And it is a nod to nostalgia. It's, um, sail it's, it's coated with sailors' tattoos, and there's actually a couple of tattoos in there that are images of sailboats I'm, I've owned, so I'm in there too. So it's, I'm, I'm a part of the piece. And it, I worked with a, a studio called In Graphics in St. Louis to uh, etch this floor. Uh, so we etched the steel. And the nod is because all the pieces that are on top of the dance floor um, are things like hemp rope and lobster pots and glass balls, things that we used to go along the beach and find that did not, that would biodegrade completely and did not harm the environment. So that's sort of my nostalgia to the past. And if you want to walk on it and get up close to something, just take your shoes off and wear socks, no bare feet. But it is a dance floor under it, so you could jump up and down on it and you, I mean, don't, don't because you might move things around, but <laughs> I say things like that and then I go, oops, maybe I shouldn't have said that. So a part of the show, Marginal Waters, was this golf project. Uh, and then um, I did a, there was another, there were three rooms in the gallery. One held the Hello Sailor, one held the documentation of these boxes. And the third room was a series of works that I wanted you to feel like you were undulating around the waves in the ocean. And this piece is called I use the titles sometimes, again. Your existence is not unlike my own. Uh, and the circular shapes in it are actually um, the first microscopic uh, record of um, cancer cells. And then what I did was I, I stripped the cancer cells out of some of them and then used that sort of funky diagram from the old microscopes and laid it over images of coral. So once again, I'm making this statement that, you know, the ocean and I are, are one and we're related and we have the same problems, I guess is one way of saying it. You know, we both have, we both have illnesses. Uh, and this is the piece that's in the back um, that, uh, you know, this, uh, this, my concern about the, the pollution, you know, it just, it, it, it was something that I didn't, it was something that sort of came slowly, you know, first from myself, and then I, I collect articles. I started collecting articles from the New York Times, which I started collecting back in 2005, 2006. Um, there's a great book that's called Blue Mind that talks about, uh, it's by a, his name is Wallace Nichols, and he talks about the fact that if you live on, in, or near water, you're happier, healthier, and better at what you do, which is probably why I moved to Rhode Island. No, only and left the Midwest, no, only kidding. But one of the things I also do is I respond to the architecture and wherever I'm in a space. So I, or, I actually really plan my exhibitions, and Sean knows this because we had long conversations via email about where I wanted to put things and what I was thinking about and how I wanted pieces to juxtapose with each other. So the pieces change because these pieces, like the piece in the back rolls up in one tube because they're all sheets that are flat that I can roll up and transport them. And so it, it changes every time I put it up. Um, and the other thing as an artist, and if there's some artists in the room, don't you just love push pins? <laughs> you know, so I decided as an artist, I was going to just put my work up with push pins. I was just going to make my own. So the push pins that hold up the piece in the back called Acid Ocean is, um, uh, they're made from cast bottle caps that I picked up off the beach. I'm really cheap with my materials. <laughs> you know, they were my molds, you know. And then uh, cast inside of them are bits of plastic. And then on this particular piece, I drop some of this oily residue and sand from the Louisiana coast into the, um, the resin before I cast them. So it's very particular to that piece. And there's a couple of other things. When you go back and look at that piece, count how many little yellow objects you can find. That because there's a book I read, um, I find very weird books, by the way. It's called Moby Duck. Anyone here re read that book yet? Okay, it's a fun book. It's, he's a reporter, and the book is about 
Um, let's see if I have, I have a little notes on it because it's so funny what he wrote. Uh, that this um, reporter found out that there was like 28,800, notice that number, um, plastic uh, toys that fell in the ocean off of a container ship. I don't you know that a lot of you know, containers are always, um, I guess I didn't put them in here. The container ships are some of the worst polluters of the ocean because the containers come off in the ocean, or, I mean, come off during storms. So there were 28,000, there it is, 800 Doitox lost at sea. And this book is about, his name's Donovan uh, Hone. It's, he, he interviewed beachcombers, oceanographers, environmentalists, and fools who went around the, ocean, the, the world trying to find these rubber toys. Now, a yellow rubber ducky was found on the coast of Maine one year later because the ocean currents react in such a way that what gets dumped in Asia can go all the way around the world and end up on our coast. So it's like, unless we do have a worldwide um, means of you know, dealing with plastic, it's not gonna make much difference. So this particular piece is a nod to Hokusai's wave. Uh, it's plastic that I um, color-coded, I got all the blues out. And instead of uh, fishermen in boats that seem insignificant, my wave is diminished by the trash that is roaring in with the tide. Um, I had a group of friends actually collecting the, tra the plastic for me in Marathon Key. I have good friends. So this is a close-up, and my push pins, now I'm making glass push pins that I fire, and I, and I paint the tops of them. So I have, I have all these creative ways that I like to make pins. And there are some, you'll, uh, those are, are all the pins um, attaching the piece on that wall too I've, I've made. So I got so, this idea of going out in the field was so interesting that I, had a ch I was invited to go on a Five Geyers expedition. Five Geyers is an organization in California that Mar the founder, Marcus Erickson, actually built a sailboat out of plastic bottles so that he could, um, sail to Hawaii and have people recognize the, you know, and be informed about plastic in the ocean. So I was on this uh, boat for a week. We, we sailed from Florida to the Eleuther Islands and we measured plastic um, with this trawler that gathered it up. And that's myself with a headlamp on with Jack Johnson, the singer, um, picking out plastic with little tiny tweezers. That's how tiny the microplastic is, you know. It's, and then Marcus Erickson is down here on the right. He's uh, working on the trawler. So um, after that, after, after the Five Geyers trip, I packed up an 18-wheeler, and my husband and I moved to Rhode Island. We decided, why not? He likes being closer to New York, and I wanted to be closer to the sea. So uh, I was uh, without a studio for about a year, but I worked in a barn. Uh, and my last show, which I just had this past May, was called uh, Sea of Heartbreak. And it was, um, I listen to the radio a lot. Uh, it's a country western song that talks about the fact that you can't, you know, you can't lose something or have a heartbreak unless you really love something. So this body of work, that's how I came up with that title. I really think about my titles. And this is called Algae Bloom, and it's 30 feet long. I mean, slides really are kind of ridiculous in my work. Um, and the, the left side represents basically r red tide, and the right represents the green algae that occurred during the Olympics in 2008 in China. So this gives you an idea. This, this piece is composed up of 35 pieces of paper uh, up to there, and they're like five by seven feet each, and they're all hand cut. Um, yeah, I know, that's what I do in the winter. You know, I sit and... Well, I won't tell you what I do while I'm cutting, but I can cut for eight hours at a time without even blinking. Um, this particular piece is called the Olympic Blob, and it's, you know, it's about the green algae um, that they had to scoop up so that the sailors could race. And these sort of shapes that are up in the top are actually um, done at, um, representational of a type of algae that they're finding in the ocean that is growing on plastic. It's actually breaking down the plastic and growing on it. So the ocean has ways to fix itself if you let it. Um, this piece is called um, The New Normal, In With the Tide. And this is kind of a turning point, a fairly new piece, in that the entire plate, instead of it being made up of nets that I embossed in the plates and then reworked these big five by uh, nine foot printing plates, I actually 
multiple times ran bits of, of trash I collected in the ocean through the press onto the plates uh, to create the plates. So this is a detail of, and all those little kind of funny little rectangular little things, those are little bits of plastic that I run through the press. This piece actually right now is in Senator Whitehouse's um, office in DC. He's a big environmentalist and so he borrowed it from me for a year, which is kind of fun. Um, and in this exhibition, The Sea of Heartbreak, I did this other piece, and Louisiana, by the way, is in this piece, several beaches are, that in my studies about the fact that, you know, we're killing the coral, okay, did you know that the beautiful Caribbean sand that all of us loved to go to and visit is actually, 70% of it is parrotfish poop. <laughs> what, what happens is parrotfish go to the coral reefs and they eat off the, you know, they, they break off bits of coral when they're getting whatever it is they're eating off the coral, but they can't digest the coral, so the coral goes through the digestive system and when it spits out the other end, it spits out to this beautiful white Caribbean sand. <laughs> so in my warped mind, which I have, I do think, um, I thought, well, that's interesting. We mean we could run out of sand? And I thought, well, Okay, and I started thinking about that, and then I read this article, another article in the New York Times. I'll tell you, the New York Times is the greatest source of information for making art. Was this article that in Miami Beach, they were running out of sand, and so they wanted to borrow it, they wanted to buy it from, they'd been dredging it in the ocean offshore, but they were running out of it. So they tried to buy it from the Bahamas, and they said, mm-mm, you can't have our sand. They tried to buy it from Northern Florida, mm-mm, you can't have our sand. So they thought up the idea of, they ground up glass, which, you know, sand makes glass, and took it out to the beaches, and they had real, you know, the sand from the beach and the ground up glass to, and brought it up to people at the beach and had them feel it, and people couldn't tell the difference. So there is a technology that, that in Florida they are, they haven't done it yet because it's too expensive, but there is this technology that they're trying to think about, like recycling glass to make beaches. So I decided, well, I could make a green beach if I recycled Pier A bottles. So this piece is called The Greening of Our Beaches. <laughs> I tell you, I have a warped sense of humor. <laughs> and so in this piece, there is some ground up, there's some bits of uh, beach glass, and uh, Sean brought me some, he sent me, or gave me some, uh, I, I forget what beach you were on in Texas, but there's, there's Louisiana and Texas and Caribbean and, and Africa, I mean, it's from all over the world. And it's shapes, it's a circular shape, which I didn't go into, because it's also, um, kind of referencing like uh, a compass rose and, and or like that the, the, everything circles around. Um, these are from actually the Luther Islands where I was on the Five Geyers trip. And then the cast glass, I worked with a glass blower in Providence and he and I cast bits of plastic. Um, we did sand casting and then poured the glass on top and created these sort of vessel-like forms that it sits on. And as again said, there's more pictures on my website. So I'm getting down to the end, so you know, hang with me. So. Um, in, two, in 2015, I w was doing a beach cleaning up in Jamestown because I'm a, a part of a group called Clean Ocean Access and we do beach cleanups. And I, I walked out on this beach and I've got a bag and I'm crunching along and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, the beach is pink. Why is the beach pink? I'm in Rhode Island. This doesn't make sense. So I came, went, ran back home, got my husband to come with his really good camera and got his, so it was kind of a collaborative piece and got him to take photographs of uh, this beach. And then I was talking to a friend of mine and through a scientist at Woods Hole, found out that uh, it was invasive algae. And so I sat on this photograph for a long time because I, I have to, I hate photographs for the most part. So why, you know, me, I, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do and I couldn't figure out, but I really wanted people to see the real thing because it was just so weird. So I ended up, um, Oops, go back a second. In, the, in this gallery, which you, um, if you go online, you can see other, the whole gallery, but this museum space, all the walls are 15 feet high except for this space, which is eight feet high. And any show I ever saw in this space, it's in the Newport Art Museum, it always felt like the stepchild. So I decided I was gonna do something so that it wasn't a stepchild anymore. So we created a wallpaper, the first wallpaper, the one behind the screen is the second one, um, of the invasive algae. And then in my quirkiness, I created 500 pieces of metal that I hand painted that we then stuck into the wall because what was so interesting was when you were back from the piece, it camouflaged, much like the fact in the ocean that things that are beautiful can be deadly. So, as, but as you got up close to the wallpaper, 
the, all these things are sticking out to attack you. Um, and I have to tell this little quip of a story because I do have, I'm going to go over maybe a couple minutes past 30 minutes, but maybe that, he'll let me. I'm almost done. I think I have one more slide. Is that there was a wedding held there while I was in, because they use this also for events. And I told the director, you know the bride is going to stand against this piece and she's never going to know this is invasive algae. And sure enough, <laughs> all of her wedding pictures are in front of my invasive algae. <laughs> so I love humor like that, I must say. So anyway, so um, after doing this piece, um, I was contacted by uh, a group in Venice. No, I have to actually, I wonder to tell you about, okay, there it is. Um, and they're called the GA Foundation, and I am going to be doing that. The piece that you saw was eight feet by 17 feet, eight feet high. The piece I am now working on, that's my studio assistant touching up all these pieces. There are 753 pieces of metal that will go on a wall that's 12 and a half feet high and 20 feet long, and it's going to be in a satellite show during the Venice Biennale. So I'm pretty excited, yeah. Thank you. I'm pretty excited about it. We just finished touching up and counting all of them on, on Friday, and I left on Saturday for here. So this is, some, this is like a side view of, so again, you see the deadly. And I changed some of the shapes because, just like an artist, I decided I didn't like the, some of the other shapes. And so I made some bigger ones and some newer ones, and I like this one much better. But that's who I am. And so then, uh, and what's so interesting is in Venice, there is a cross-disciplinary center focusing on ocean conservation that is opening in March um, about on the effects of climate change. And it's going to be a center for uh, to, to break down the barriers between different disciplines that uh, artists can work alongside scientists, researchers, lawyers, and policymakers to take a holistic view on the environment. And all I can say is I was there first. Because at the, in, in, uh, this is not the greatest photo of me, but in uh, Newport, I wanted to put together a panel during the exhibition with Senator Whitehouse, who's like the, the biggest advocate for climate change um, in Washington. And it was narrated by, um, or not narrated, it was, um, what did she, she was, the woman who ran, who asked all the questions, I can't think of the name right now, um, by the, the art and advocacy um, uh, environmental reporter for NPR in Rhode Island. Her name's Avery Brookins, so she's over here on the left. And Senator Whitehouse, myself, and then Jonathan Stone, who started an organization called Save the Bay many years ago. And it was very interesting because I wanted, I wanted this. I wanted to have a politician and an, uh, an advocate and an artist all talking about climate change so people understood that artists, we also talk about important issues, but we, may, we do it in very different ways. We do it visually. And it was, um, it was really an interesting thing to do, and I was really excited about it. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.